Hey guys and welcome back to the channel. It's still DOSember where a bunch of YouTubers go ahead and create MS-DOS or DOS based videos. And no, this is not going to be a Commodore video, but this is going to be a video about MS-DOS 2.x, 2.11 in this case. This Commodore disk being the only official copy that I have of MS-DOS 2. Now the goal is to install this on this gorgeous IBM PC XT because this IBM PC XT was the PC that originally came with MS-DOS 2.x. Now this is a PC with a 10 megabyte hard drive and MS-DOS 2 was the first version of MS-DOS to support hard drives. So here I am thinking, why wouldn't I just install it on this gorgeous machine? But that would be too easy, right? What I also have is this machine over here. Now this machine was brought to me by a fellow retro collector and unfortunately the machine is not working. But it does have the original IBM floppy drive and the original IBM hard drive. It's a computer from Info Products Holland apparently, so a Dutch PC. As you can see from the case it does need a little bit of work. I'm hoping that I will be able to fix it, but like I said, the original owner told me that it didn't do anything when he started her up. Looking on the back, it doesn't seem all that surprising as it even looks worse from this angle here. But this is an IBM PC XT, the 5160, so it's definitely worth taking a look at it. So it is missing the IBM badge, which is unfortunate. It has the original IBM floppy drive, 360 kilobytes, and the original Seagate 10 megabyte MFM hard drive. It has the clunky power button, of course. And on the back, we have the IBM sticker. We have the power supply. This seems to be the external floppy drive connector from the floppy controller card. This appears to be a CGA card, judging by the composite output. And there are probably some other cards here as well. So let's open her up to see what we have inside. And at first glance, it looks pretty clean inside, a lot cleaner than the outside. So standard layout, the 10 megabyte hard drive, 360 kilobyte floppy drive, power supply and some expansion cards. So let's take a look at them. First up, we have the graphics card and this is the IBM Color Graphics Adapter or CGA card. It comes in different colors and this one I particularly like. It's kind of this greenish PCB. So yeah, that's really nice. Here we have what appears to be a memory expansion card. So this is the official IBM memory expansion card for this machine. This can take anything from 64 kilobytes up to 256 kilobytes of additional memory. So I'm guessing this is fully maxed out to 256 kilobytes of memory with the 256 on board, giving us a total of 512 kilobytes of RAM for this machine. Here we have the floppy drive controller. Also like this PCB color here. Normally they come in this kind of greenish color, but yeah, I really like uh, the look of this one. So this is the internal floppy drive connector and it also has an external connector. Last up, we have the MFM controller card. Again, an original IBM controller card. This one is only capable of hooking up a 10 megabyte ST412 interface type MFM drive. Here we have the motherboard, lots of dust cooked on here. And I already see a popped tantalum capacitor, which is not really a surprise. So this board is fully maxed out. It has 256 kilobytes of onboard memory. And here we get a close view of the blown capacitor. Time for the smoke test. And indeed the machine isn't doing anything. The power supply unit fan isn't spinning. I don't hear the hard drive, so it's basically dead. I had already removed all the expansion cards and I did check for shorts on the five volts and 12 volt rails, but now I disconnected the motherboard also to see what would happen. But again, nothing. The power supply fan wasn't running and the machine was completely dead. 
obviously the floppy drive can also cause a short so I disconnected that one but same thing so at that point you only have the power supply and the hard drive connected and one of the two should ideally start so I'm guessing that either one of the two or both are in fact dead now disconnecting the hard drive isn't really an option because this type of power supply does require a load to start so you just can't fire up the power supply without putting a load on it so time to take a look at the power supply so four screws hold it in place so let's remove those it is a tight fit here so we need to remove the hard drive and the floppy drive before we can remove the power supply and the hard drive is held in place with the screw here on the bottom of the case so we need to remove that there are two additional screws here on the side and once they are removed we can slide the hard drive out I mean, just look at this thing full height seagate 10 megabyte awesome thing i'm also going to be removing the floppy drive because that is needed in order to get the power supply out of the case and oh my gosh what is this there's like this brownish goo here both on the power supply and on the case something has leaked here obviously I'm also going to be removing the motherboard because I want to take everything out and test some stuff in isolation so yeah kind of wiggling the motherboard out of the case and here I have the power supply I have hooked it up to the hard drive and I do see a voltage coming out of the power supply so there is a 5 volt output but the hard drive isn't doing anything and the power supply fan isn't spinning there's also a 12 volt output so I'm guessing that this power supply kind of works so let's hook up a three and a half inch IDE drive and see if that will spin up now I do have to say that depending on the type of power supply this might not be sufficient to start up the power supply but in this case it is apparently able to start up this IDE hard drive so I'm guessing that the power supply is in fact okay there's just a problem with the fan inside the power supply so yeah time to open up the power supply and see what we have and this is the kind of annoying thing about these kind of PC diagnostics because a lot of these diagnostics are like you know is the power supply fan running then do this if it doesn't then do that so yeah lots of screws holding the power supply in place so let's open her up and mystery solved so I guess this is why the power supply fan wasn't spinning the thing just broke off completely and landed on the PCB here yeah never seen anything like this other than that the power supply does seem to be in pretty good shape but replacing this fan or fixing it is going to be a pain replacing it is difficult because it's not using screws to hold it onto the chassis it's kind of bolted onto the chassis and yeah fixing that will be very difficult but now back to the motherboard and let's take a look at this c56 capacitor a tantalum capacitor that has blown and the c56 capacitor is the one which is hooked up to the 12 volt rail c58 is another capacitor which is prone to failure now this one didn't blow and this one is hooked up to the minus 12 volt rails now if you look at this p8 connector which is the connector coming from the power supply we see the black leads so the, this is the ground the yellow one is the minus 12 volts and the green one is the plus 12 volts now on the molex connector which is the connector that i typically use to hook up my multimeter we only have the plus 12 volts which is the green lead so it is possible that there is a short also on the minus 12 volts and this can only be measured on the power connector itself so let's hook up the multimeter and identify a ground pin which is this one here so there are four in total so those will provide continuity and let's check the other ones so this is okay this is okay this is okay and oops so here we have an issue and that is indeed the minus 12 volt rail and this is this capacitor here the c58 so it doesn't look broken but it is in fact causing a short and it will prevent the computer from booting the other pins aren't causing any shorts so i'm guessing that the blown capacitor on the 12 volt rail that we just saw isn't causing a short but we might as well replace it although it's not really required for uh, operating the system and the capacitor here on the minus 12 volt rail which looks good is in fact causing a short so just by checking with the multimeter we can see that the plus and the minus are in fact shorted 
Now, minus 12 volts isn't really used in an IBM PC XT, except for a small number of very rare expansion cards. So not really critical and you do not need to replace it if you don't have a replacement. So using a set of tweezers, we can remove the blown capacitor. I'm just going to use my soldering iron to heat up the pads here and then wiggle it out. So it should just drop right on out. And here we have it. So this is a three-legged tantalum capacitor and we can replace that with a two-legged one. The only thing we need to take into account is make sure that we insert it in the proper orientation, so the plus being in the middle, and then we can start her up. But with only the CGA card installed, I got the long beep followed by two short beeps, which indicates a video issue. I tried a different slot and the situation kind of improved a little bit, but still wasn't what I was expecting. After that, I reseeded the character ROM chip on the CGA card, and after that, the card seems to be functioning okay. There are a couple of errors here, but that is related to the fact that there is nothing attached here, and I don't have the memory expansion installed. So next up was the floppy drive, and although it did initialize, it wasn't able to read any floppy disks, and it just launched into uh, IBM BASIC. So let's take a look at this floppy drive. Now luckily I have two of them, so I do have something to compare them with. And I do have some prior experience with those floppy drives, because the previous one also had some bad capacitors that needed fixing. There was a line filter which was broken. So yeah, we're just going to see uh, what uh, is potentially wrong with uh, this floppy drive. So for that I'm going to be disconnecting all of the little connectors here and getting the PCB out, because this is something that you need to do anyway if you want to access the head assembly and if you want to clean the heads, for example, which is something that we will do now. So I'm just going to be using some isopropyl alcohol and using this cotton swab to just clean the heads gently on both sides. Now I do like to give the old ESR meter a spin from time to time and I was checking some of the capacitors and I did notice some of them had fairly high ESR values. Now, it's always difficult to measure these things in circuit because some of them will report in circuit leaky or some of them will report an open circuit or low capacitance. And this can always be the result of them being in circuit. So, yeah, because I am suspecting some of them to be bad, I did remove them from the PCB and tested them separately. But I doubt that there's going to be an issue with the capacitor. So I went over to compare the mechanical side of things and I noticed that you know the head assembly had a very hard time moving here on the bad floppy drive whereas on the good one it was very smooth so this was definitely an issue so this is probably the lubricant of the of the servo motor which is totally gummed up and just needs to have some activity now before it is able to start and after wiggling about a little bit, I was able to boot into the IBM Personal Computer Advanced Diagnostics disk. So that was good. I was able to read the content from that floppy, so that all seemed to work. I was also able to uh, execute commands from that floppy, so that's good. And I was also able to format disks. So yeah, I guess the floppy drive is okay. It was just you know the little stepper motor that was kind of gummed up and needed to be loosened a little bit. So, moving on to the hard drive, the IBM Seagate 10 megabyte MFM hard drive. Now, this one was, well, appeared to be completely dead. It wasn't doing anything. So, yeah, that's a bit of an issue. Uh, I would really like to revive this hard drive because I like the sound of these things. I, I also feel that if you have an IBM PC XT, you need to have it with this particular hard drive because, you know, it's a fairly iconic machine. So let's see what's up with this hard drive. So we'll start by removing the PCB. And there are a couple of connectors which hold the PCB uh, attached to uh, the other parts of the hard drive. So we need to remove those connectors first. We have a couple of connectors here on the front which are very difficult to remove. So I'm going to be removing the front plate here. So that will make it a little bit easier to remove these connectors. And after removing the power connector, we can just slide the PCB right on out. 
And what we see here is the actual spindle motor, which is responsible for spinning the platters in the hard drive. And this seems to be completely stuck. Uh, I noticed that it is getting the 12 volts, which is needed to operate that spindle motor, but obviously it isn't moving at all. And I did notice that when I turn on the PC, it kind of nudges a little bit, it tries to start, but it isn't really capable of rotating it. So at that point, I try to really gently nudge it a little bit. And this was actually a process that took about 10 minutes. So I was really careful with that because obviously what you don't want to have is, you know, violently moving these platters around while the heads are attached to the platters. So I was kind of really careful with that. And I started to notice that there was some motion um, getting into the spindle motor here. At some point I was able to move it full circle. And after a couple of minutes, I was able to rotate it and it did several cycles on its own. So that was already good. But again, this looks really quick here, but I actually spent like half an hour with it, I think in total. And at a certain point it started spinning multiple times, but eventually it stopped. And then when I swung it again, the motor kicked in and you just heard this absolutely wonderful sound of the hard drive spinning on its own. Now I have to admit, at this point, I thought that the hard drive would be toast, as you heard this kind of metallic sound, which sounds awful. But this doesn't necessarily have to mean that this is, you know, the heads which are totally destroying your platters, but this could just as well be, you know, the sound that the bearings make. So yeah, at this point, I was pretty happy that, <laughs> you know, the, the hard drive was spinning again. So. Let's see if we put it all back together again, what we can see in MS-DOS and what we can uh, recuperate from this hard drive. But I'm just going to let you enjoy the sounds of this hard drive a little bit. So yeah, it doesn't sound super healthy, but let's assume for now that it's just the bearings and that the hard drive is in fact working fine. So yeah, back in the PC with the hard drive and you hear this kind of knocking sounds and sounds that you're not supposed to hear, I think, with a hard drive like this. So obviously we don't have a C prompt and if we load up FDisk and try to display the partition data, FDisk reports that it is having trouble reading the fixed disk. Now it is talking to the disk, I can hear it responding to the command, but it wasn't until I did a low level format that I saw, you know, the servo motor spinning for the very first time. So again, I was cautiously optimistic that I would be able to do a low level format on this thing, but it did take a very long time and yeah, the, the servo motor was kind of acting a little bit erratic. I don't think that it should be uh, operating this way during a low level format. It should just complete its cycle. Um, but it did eventually did the low level format, so that was good. And when I loaded up FDisk now to display the partition data, I didn't get an error anymore, but instead I got the message that there was no partition defined. So that is really good. So I decided to create a DOS partition using the entire uh, size of the disk. Then you need to reboot. Just going to verify that the partition is in fact created. It is. And then we can go ahead and try to format the drive. Now I was able to read it. Uh, 
I think in a later version of Amazaz it prevents you from uh, loading up a directory listing if the drive isn't formatted yet, but here it just displays some garbage. So trying to do a format C, I was confronted with the error that this disk would be unsuitable for system disk, which was not good. And the actual format in MS-DOS took like over an hour and the servo motor here was just doing this constantly. So I think it's doing some kind of error correction or it is detecting bad sectors. So yeah, wasn't really happy with seeing this. So after about half an hour, it was almost at about 70%. So kind of did this until it reached a uh, full circle and when it finally completed the format I noticed that it had three megabytes of bad sectors which was definitely not good now the computer was able to boot from the hard drive but you know having three megabytes of bad sectors on a 10 megabyte hard drive isn't ideal so then I decided to just let it sit there for a while and I noticed that the sound was actually improving it wasn't perfect yet but you know the knocking sound was gone and although you could still hear this kind of metallic sound it did sound already a lot better. So with the machine running for a couple of hours let's try to do the low level format again. So I'm going to load up my IBM diagnostics disk and boot from that. I also decided to hook up a VGA monitor to my IBM PCXT and I'm going to be using this MCE2 VGA board for that. So basically you can put in a MDA, CGA or EGA signal on one end and then a VGA signal will come out on the other end allowing you to hook up a modern VGA monitor or LCD display. You can find more details on that in the video description and I've also created a video on that a while back. The diagnostic disk will present you with a menu here and you need to specify system checkout. Now this takes a while to load, but finally we will be presented with a menu where we need to confirm that the list of installed devices is indeed correct, which is the case. So I'm going to hit yes. And then we will opt to run the tests one time. Then we need to specify the item under test, which is the fixed disk drive. And now we can opt to format the fixed disk by entering item number two. We enter the drive ID, which in this case is the C drive. We get a warning, hit yes to continue, and it will start the low level format. Now what you see now, as opposed to the erratic servo motor behavior you saw in the first low level format, is that it is slowly but surely going about its business completing the full cycle, returning back to position zero, and then doing the same all over again. And that is something that you would expect it to do during a low level format. This takes about five minutes or so, and after that you will be presented with the menu again. Now from this menu you can also decide to run the fixed disk test. And this will execute a number of tests on your hard drive. So you again specify the drive ID, which is C. You get a warning that cylinder 305 will be overwritten during the test. And then it will start by performing a seek test. And there you should see some random behavior on the servo motor. It will then be followed by a complete surface scan and there you will see that the servo motor will start at position zero and work its way all the way to the end before it goes back to position zero. So after that it is finally time to boot with our MS-DOS 2.11 system disk. I'm going to be using this Commodore disk here. Again this is the only official MS-DOS 2.11 X disk that I have. I don't think that there are even boxed copies of MS-DOS 2. I do have some boxed copies of MS-DOS 3 and 4 and 5, but none uh, of version 2. So this is booting. You get a bunch of copyright messages. You get the A prompt. And from that, we can load up F disk, create our first partition. And what you will see here is that F disk looks a little bit different than what you are used to with standard MS-DOS. I don't know if this is uh, uh, specific to, to Commodore, but 
the way that you need to partition the drive is a little bit different than what you are used to. Uh, it doesn't set the first partition to active automatically, so you mustn't forget to do that, otherwise your system will not boot. But here we've created a partition uh, occupying the full space of the hard drive. Then we will do a restart, and after that we can check to see that we have a C drive. Again, we can get a directory listing from this drive, even though it is not formatted, something which is not possible in later versions of MS-DOS. But now we can go ahead and format the drive. You get this little warning here, hit yes, and it will start formatting the drive. And one thing you can notice here is as it is doing its format, at a certain point, the servo motor will kind of reset itself. So here you can see that it's going back to position zero before continuing. And I guess this is some kind of error correction or bad sector detection that it has encountered. But it will go all the way to the end, go back to position zero, and your format will be done. And here you can see that we have about 61 kilobytes of bad sectors now, which is a whole lot better than the three megabytes of bad sectors we had at the beginning. You can transfer the system now. The sys command doesn't copy the command.com as it does in later MS-DOS versions, so this is something that we need to do manual here. So we'll copy the command.com to the C drive, and then in theory we should be able to boot from the hard drive. So let's give that a go. And indeed, she boots. So we get the same messages as we get from the floppy disk, but it is booting off of the hard drive now. So we get the C prompt, so mission accomplished. So that's about it for now. This actually took a little bit longer than I thought. Not only the video, but also the process of getting the IBM PCXT back together again and fully operational. We didn't get to see a whole lot of MS-DOS, but I will make up for that in a future video, hopefully soon. In the meantime, I really hope you've enjoyed this video. If you did, please consider subscribing. Hit that notification bell so you get notified of new videos. Hit the like button, leave a comment below. I wish you guys all the best for the remainder of this year and next year. Please stay safe, stay healthy everybody, and I hope to see you guys very soon. Bye-bye.